What is... I'm sorry, but this doesn't make sense at all. Sir, according to my research, this is the situation. What is the Chinese Navy has one ex-Soviet carrier, a copy of an ex-Soviet carrier. They are building a indigenous medium carrier and that's basically it. They also put on hold the building of the fourth carrier. This is at best an incomplete view, sir. What is this is the Chinese Navy, it's not the US Navy. They don't have the same power projection requirements. In fact, they don't. Their purpose is different. Okay, so what's the purpose for you? Let me explain, sir. Hey, we have already covered the recent history of the efforts of the Chinese Navy to acquire aircraft carrier capabilities in the context of the description of the long shadow that has been cast by the Soviet naval aviation on many modern navies. The video covers a lot of details and if you're interested, you can find it here. For our purpose today, it's enough to recall that China operates two aircraft carriers. The first is actually the ex-Soviet ship Variag, purchased in shady circumstances in 1998. There was an adventurous towing to China, a long refit, and finally in 2016, the ship has been declared operational under the name of Liaoning. But that wasn't to remain an isolated case. In 2007, China purchased from Russia four sets of aircraft carrier landing arrest equipment. So this was a clear indication that something else was going to happen. And in fact, in 2013, the building of an entirely domestic carrier was started. The ship was actually a bigger and slightly more capable copy of the Liaoning, with a displacement of about 70,000 tons. The lessons learned with the Liaoning had been put in practice with the Shandong, this is the name of the second carrier, increasing the room available for the aircraft and also improving the deck operations. At the end of 2019, the carrier was declared combat ready. And after the Shandong, nobody expected the Chinese to stop there. And in fact, the Type 003 came along. In 2016 and 2017, reports about this new aircraft carrier started to appear in the specialized press. Soon it was clear that in Shanghai, something big was being built by the Jiangnam Shipyard Group. In mind, this is not the same Dalian shipyard that built the previous two. So the Chinese have two shipyards with the capability of building aircraft carriers. We don't know much about the ship, but all the information that we have, which comes from the fragments of information that are actually published on the Chinese internet, rather than from the satellite pictures that we have, of the construction have been really dissected by the analysts so we can have some rough estimates about the ship. The most recent estimates place the Type 003 at 318 meters length with a beam of 78 meters on the flight deck. The displacement has been estimated to be a little shy of 100,000 tons larger than the initial estimates. Overall, this means that the carrier is probably just slightly smaller than the Gerald Ford class. Some analysts actually believe that the ship was going to be some sort of an intermediate model akin to what the Kitty Hawk had been many years ago in the United States fleet, but it doesn't seem to be the case. So the Chinese apparently skip a generation and the fact that there is a large basing beam built in the south that is pretty much just big enough to host a Type 003 is probably telling us that this is going to be a sort of a standard measure for Chinese aircraft for the years to come. The Type 003 is still being built, but we can identify some differences with the Ford class. For example, the Type 003 doesn't feature a nuclear propulsion, 
but its propulsion system is not entirely conventional either. In fact, it seems that the ship is going to have an integrated electric propulsion. This means that turbines, boilers or any other power generating element on board of the ship is not connected directly with the propellers, but is only used to produce electrical power, which is transferred to electrical engines driving the propellers. This type of propulsion is becoming increasingly popular because it has several advantages in terms of design but also efficiency compared with older configurations. But this choice also makes sense because the Type 003 will be equipped with three electromagnetic catapults, each one of those 105 meters long. On a carrier flight deck, basically we just see a rail with a shuttle moving on it. But actually catapult is a relatively large system that, that may influence the whole ship design. For example, steam catapults require the boiler to generate the steams and all the piping required to bring the steam from the boiler uh, to the catapult that has a complex mechanical system that pushes the aircraft when is needed. On the contrary, electromagnetic catapults require a large amount of electric power being delivered very quickly to accelerate the aircraft. And this requires to bring the electrical power to accumulation devices and all uh, the cabling that is actually required, all the control systems. In the United States, the development of the emails has been long and bumpy, but the advantages of the solution compared with the steam catapults is quite clear. The Chinese don't have any direct experience, but even in this case they have decided to skip a generation and point directly to the most modern solution. Another element that heavily influences the design of the ship is the hangar. It seems that the hangar of the Type 003 is going to be slightly smaller than the Ford class hangar and it will have only two large aircraft elevators rather than the three that are present on the Ford class. The ship is expected to be launched in 2022, to be delivered in 2024, and to reach the initial operational capability in 2025 or 2026. However, the Chinese don't have any experience in running a catobar carrier, so delays are definitely possible. And this consideration, rather than budgetary concerns, is probably the reason why the Chinese have decided to pull the project of the Type 004, a nuclear aircraft carrier, on hold for the moment. In fact, if we have to listen to official plan statements, the service is actually still evaluating aircraft carriers to see if they are useful or not. So, in theory, current carriers, including 003, are all experimental carriers, useful to train people, establish a doctrine, and establish a naval tradition about aircraft carriers. So, while it's obviously true that the Chinese Navy has to go through a learning curve, this entire approach doesn't seem to be realistic. And this is what Otis was saying at the beginning. And actually, he has an idea. Carriers allow sea control over critical trade routes, and they project air power over coastal areas up to a depth into the continental mass that includes the bulk of the population. They can deny the use of the sea to an opponent, and they can protect friendly or neutral sea traffic that is essential for the survival. And in fact, the United States uses the carriers to project power globally. This is basically what a maritime empire does, and the United States are a maritime empire, even though I'm well aware that this way of putting things is definitely not politically correct. But what is the imperial drive for China? Well, for China is the necessity of having access to energy and food. The most important maritime routes for China are those that lead to the Middle East for oil, So, from the point of view of China, it may seem reasonable to have a force of aircraft carrier capable of protecting those trade routes from the only opponent that 
in theory has the possibility and the capability to shut them off, the United States. However, look at the map. Well, it looks like China has a problem. Right here, the Malacca Strait. It is a choke point surrounded by countries whose allegiance may not necessarily be to the Chinese. Those countries may host American or Western coalition forces that build a barrier that make the Middle East and Africa completely inaccessible, even without aircraft carriers. If the United States could assure the loyalty of countries like Singapore, but also Malaysia or uh, Indonesia, Thailand, Vietnam, there is no way for the, that the Chinese could open up that route. In that case, the only possibility for the Chinese would be a physical invasion of those land areas or a neutralization of all the infrastructures that would be used by a Western coalition in those areas. And now, what would you need to do such an operation? Well, obviously an invasion force, an amphibious force, But mostly, you need air superiority. And the only way to bring aircraft from China in the area against a hostile opposition? Yeah, it's a force of aircraft carriers. Okay, but now, don't forget that the American carriers will still be there. And with the carriers still available, what should you do before acquiring the control of the Straits? West for a long time has been sort of assumed that the long-term plan of the Chinese was to deploy six aircraft carrier, two in the north, two in the south and two in the east facing Taiwan, where the carrier were going to become the centerpiece of a defensive system that goes beyond the first island chain. However, some analysts have found older Chinese publications that actually hint to something different. In some Chinese publications, it is stated that they are well aware that no real confrontation with the United States may happen till the Chinese Navy is actually capable of fighting and winning against the US Navy in blue waters. And to do so, they assessed that at least a force of 10 aircraft carriers was needed. And mind, the Chinese always make long-term plans. So, what if, and it, this is a what if, this is a speculation, what if the Type 004 carriers and eventually the, a future 005 are going to be designed to attack and defeat the US Navy in blue water? What if they are not going to be defensive tools, but they're going to be offensive weapons? What kind of ship do you need? And in particular, what kind of carrier group and what kind of carrier wing do you need to execute this mission? Well, this will be the subject of the next video. So if you like this video, there are several other videos on the channel about China, the Chinese armed forces and the Chinese Navy too. They are going to appear beside me. A big thank you to all those who support the channel on Patreon or by being a member. And patrons and members will have access to the documentation that I actually used to prepare this video. If you didn't like this video, thank you very much for watching so far. Thank you very much for watching and see you there.